Mr. Ross will start the debate tonight with the affirmative position and the proposition tonight. The scriptures teach that salvation comes at the point of faith alone, before and without any further acts of obedience. Mr. Ross will affirm, so I turn it now over to Mr. Ross. Thank you, Brother Larry, Brother Elkins, Brother Meredith. Good to be back here this evening to continue the debate for the last night. And uh, I always like to remind people, if you have the patience and endurance that sometimes these debates put upon all of us, please stay till the last speech is over, and even to Mr. Varner's closing remarks, because I don't really think a debate is completed until it's completely well-rounded that way. And sometimes the person, if they're on the opposite side of the fence, and the, the speaker is going to be speaking that they don't agree with, then they're going to say, well, I'm just going to get up and leave. I don't think that's very courteous. And since the Baptists tonight are on the opposite side of the fence, Mr. Elkins will be speaking live. I hope that uh, all of you, unless there's some reason, you have to leave. I hope you'll stay here and listen to him to the end. Because if you're not here for the purpose of investigation and put, to put things out on the line to be tested, then... You should not be here uh, at any, for any reason. That's why we're here. Try to be honest, try to be open. And even though these clashes exist, I think that, uh, well, if the truth, I've heard this illustration, if the truth is rubbed, it'll only shine the brighter. And I hope that one, or uh, it could be possible that we're both wrong, but uh, I don't know about both of us being right, but I'm sure that if we're, if we're rubbing the truth of the Bible, the Bible will stand on its own. I know that. So please observe that courtesy to the closing speaker. Now, a, a mention was made last night about the advertisement in the newspaper, the word alone being left out. Well, let me make it clear again about Baptist's position on salvation by faith. The bad disposition on salvation by faith, whether we use the word alone, whether we use the word faith, or whether we use the word salvation, it's always salvation by grace through faith alone. If I say I'm saved, I mean I'm saved by faith alone. If I say I'm saved by faith, I mean I'm saved by faith alone. So we don't shy around the word. It's an, just an inadvertence or some unexplainable mistake that might leave it out because it was written into the proposition. But so far as my knowledge concerned, was concerned, I signed and only saw one thing, and that was the proposition that I returned, and the word alone was in it. Now, what appears in the newspaper reflects nothing uh, of, that I had anything to do with. And I certainly wouldn't sign a proposition that had a word in it to debate and then think that I could leave it out of a newspaper ad or something and sneak by with it. Why, uh, I debate and I catch those things and if there are any significance, I try to use them. Now, he uh, put up a chart last evening about Sam Morris and uh, a quote from Sam Morris. I just really wonder if the man has the original track or paper that Sam Morris is quoted from. I'll not hold him responsible if he doesn't, because actually Sam Morris is not on the proposition in this debate. But one time I called for it, or it was volunteered to me or something, and I got it. And I read it, and I found out that all this quoting of Sam Morris I've been hearing for years was a complete distortion. It's lifted completely out of context, and I want to read you just a little bit so that you'll see it. Do you mean to say it doesn't make any difference how man lives? No, I do not mean to say anything of a sort. It does make a difference how he lives, but that difference relates to his fellowship with God, his prayer, his conscience, his joy, his influence, his heavenly reward, not to the salvation of his soul. The human soul is damned not by sin, but by sin, one sin, the sin of distrust or disbelief in Christ. Now, friends, if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
You're not going to be any worse off if you're a drunkard or a harlot or a delta as far as health is concerned, are you? I mean, you don't have to be a drunkard and a harlot and a thief to go to hell. All it takes is to be an unbeliever. Now, that's what Sam Morris is saying in this little booklet right here, and he lifted out the part, but dot, dot, dot. Now, Garland, if you want to defend, or if you want to me to defend what's said in this track here, uh, I'll be glad to do that. But I don't want to defend something where the dot, dot, dot leaves out something that's significant to the understanding of a Baptist preacher's position on this doctrine. Now, that's how we're quoted, though, from time to time, and that's why a lot of people think that we are so far off base about things. They've just got these representations of us that are misrepresentations. Now, the questions I submitted to uh, Mr. Elkins before the debate according to the agreement and they're available to you in room 112. Let's go over those right quickly. If faith before baptism is alive, as you asserted on Thursday night, now he's departed in this question or position from historic restorationism, but we appreciate that. But inasmuch as he said that faith before baptism is alive, as you asserted on Tuesday night, at what point did faith before baptism become alive? Number two, is the faith which obeys the command to believe alive or dead when it obeys that command? Number three, does James chapter two condemn the faith which obeys the command to believe before any other act of obedience, including repentance and confession? Number four, if faith is not alive at its earliest inception, does James chapter 2 condemn faith at its earliest inception? Number five, does God command men to have a dead faith at faith's earliest inception? Now, we'll let him answer those, and then I will make some comments with regard to the answers that he might make, because... I have finally driven him back to the place where that all restorationist preachers ultimately go shipwrecked. And that's on the doctrine of faith before baptism. I've seen it happen in practically every debate I've had. They shipwreck on the subject of faith before baptism. They have to either give up James chapter 2 as having no reference to faith before baptism, or they have to choke to death on the fact that they preach a dead faith before baptism. Now, either horn they take, they're going to choke to death on the matter of faith before baptism. Now, open the little Salvation by Grace booklet, which was passed out last night, or excuse me, that was made available last night. And... Uh, Turn to page 9, and I'll continue my affirmative from the material here, beginning at the top of the, fa uh, top of the page. And I'm repeating an argument that was presented last night, but so far as I could detect, Mr. Elkins did not touch side, top, nor bottom. My first affirmative argument is that all the promises as to the initial blessings and salvation are made to true and living faith. There are no promises to faith only or to dead faith or faith like the devils have or to a faith which is not obedient faith, but promises are made to true faith or trust in Jesus Christ. The entire book of John was written to motivate faith in Christ. The quote I have here, John 20, 31, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now this book is filled with verses which teach that the initial salvation or spiritual life at its origin comes at the point of obedient faith. Mr. Elkins has no use for these verses as he can't find any promises this side of the baptistry, but all true believers, those who have indeed trusted Christ, not some of these that he brings up that it's obvious that they're not trusting Christ, but those who have really trusted Christ, they rejoice in these verses. I'll refer to these once again tonight as I did uh, a few nights, uh, well, last night. John 3, 18, John 3, 36, John 6, 47, 
they practically are repetitious because there's so many of these verses in John and in the Bible that the Lord is, I think, obviously trying to show us how simple and how clear the plan of salvation is. We don't have to jump here, there, and yon and tie together a little idea here and a little idea there and come up with a patchwork idea on salvation. We have it clear. John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. Now look at the top up here, that line that's at the top. These verses alone prove the proposition, but not these verses only. Others do also. Now the reason I'm putting that there, I want you to show I want to show you that alone and only are not synonymous. He got up here last night and he said uh, Mark 16, 16 proved his proposition, and the inference was that Mark 16, 16 alone proved his proposition. Well, now, is he going to throw out Acts 38 and say it's Mark 16, 16 only? You see the part, friends? You can have something alone, but it doesn't imply only. All right, let's go on now. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Contrast to restorationalism on this. At the point of belief, Mr. Elkins will have to admit he was condemned. He had no eternal life. He had a dead faith because he said it's false that faith is alive at its inception. And then, according to one of the writers in the spiritual sword, he was in the prison house of Lucifer before baptism. Now, that's the contrast between Bible faith and uh, restoration faith. Now, I have another one here I presented the other night. I don't think that he dealt with any of these verses. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And J.D. Bales, one of their brethren, says, Faith is really a work, the highest work, for by it man gives himself. Now Elkin said, and I've marked out the bottom here because he said he didn't believe that, I had Elkins endorse his Warren's dead faith till baptism heresy. Well, he said he didn't believe that. So if that's so, I've marked it off. I'm glad to hear that. He's getting further away from error. Now, Elkins says faith is dead at its inception. That was last night. So uh, we want to know, Mr. Elkins, since it's alive before baptism and it's dead at its inception, we want to know when it comes to life. You can tell us that, I'm sure. Now look at this one here. Gus Nichols proves faith before baptism is not dead faith. You can copy the reference from the spiritual sword there, Mr. Meriden. When one believes, he's obeying a command. All right? Faith is as much a work as is baptism. All right? Until faith obeys, it is dead, as James said. All right? Since it's a command to believe and faith is a work, then what about it? It obeys the command, and it's not dead at its inception. Faith is therefore alive at its inception. Now let's go on to another chart here very quickly. Elkins versus McGarvey. I quoted you from J.W. McGarvey, who's regarded as the outstanding commentary on Acts, has the outstanding commentary on Acts and the uh, so-called restoration movement. Now, Elkins here versus McGarvey, and in the spiritual sword, he's called a restoration giant. That's why I put him a little bigger than Mr. Elkins over here. Now, Elkins says faith is not dead before baptism. He said that last night. McGarvey says on page 210 of his commentary on Acts, faith is dead until the believer is immersed. Now, we have one restoration giant over here, and we have a restoration puppet over here. And which one of these men are you going to accept? The giant or the puppet? Elkins, therefore, at Warren's behest, repudiates the doctrine of faith taught by McGarvey and other restoration. We commend him for doing so. All right, now look at this one, the Warren logic. I'm glad Mr. Warren came down here. He's teaching me a little bit about logic. The Warren logic, he's the brother logician of the brotherhood. If doctrine X implies doctrine Y, and if Y is false, then X is also false. That's from the spiritual source. Now, let's look at doctrine X. Faith in Christ at its inception is dead faith. Garland Elkins last night. All right, Y then is implied. God commands sinners to have dead faith in Christ at faith's inception because God commands faith at its inception. 
Doctrine Y is obviously false, therefore. Doctrine X is also false. Therefore, faith in Christ at its inception is not dead because both of these doctrines are false. Thank you for calling that point of logic to our attention. Now, here's the great mystery we want to solve tonight, I hope. The great mystery, when does faith become alive? The gospel plan is hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, you see. All right, now, Warren and Elkins' faith begins over here, and they say it gets completed over here. The command, believe, at its inception, Garland Elkins says it's dead. It has a stillbirth. Now, Garland, I want you to fill in here somewhere along the line where faith becomes alive or it's born because you have it alive last night before baptism. You said faith before baptism is alive, and it's alive in baptism, so if it's dead over here and it's alive over here, you tell us, was it alive before repentance, at repentance, before confession, or at confession? Will Elkins please indicate Mr. Warren's idea as to when faith becomes alive? Because I'm sure that he's up here, going to get up here and tell us what Mr. Warren thinks about it. Now here's another one. Bible faith contrasted to Elkins Warren's faith. Born of God, alive at inception, not condemned, a work of God. Now when is Elkins' faith born? He says it's dead at its inception. He says he that believeth is condemned. He says it's a work of the flesh or man to believe. Now, restorationists deny being born of God before baptism. I can quote that out of the spiritual sword. A man's not born again until he's baptized. Therefore, they do not have the faith which is born of God. Hence, restorationists have a dead faith not born of God. Now, if faith is alive before baptism, it is born before baptism. Whoever has live faith is born of God, 1 John 5, 4, before baptism. Therefore, believers with live faith are born of God without baptism and before, of course, baptism. Now let's get to this one. Elkins condemns B.C. Good Pastor. The Preachers of Today book I read last night, the 1964 edition by the Gospel Advocate, published by the Advocate at that time under B.C. Good Pastor. The book lists the men who are preaching the good news. Brown Kennard is one of those men. Elkin says Brown Kennard is wrong. Spiritual sword honors good pastor as a valiant soldier of the cross, January of 73. But Elkins condemns good pastor since good pastor lists Kennard as one preaching the good news. Elkins also condemns Firm Foundation, which published Kennard's 1962 article. Now, and Kennard, by the way, said the element of truth of salvation by faith alone, it's truth. And I'll quote the article again probably before this debate's over. Garland Elkins versus the Gospel Advocate. They published the book Preachers of Today with this Kennard or Kennard, I think he said. I don't know how to say his name, but that'd be all right. You got the message. They published the book. They endorsed the man as one preaching the good news. Now, Firm Foundation magazine originally published the article. The Gospel Guardian reprinted the article as to Brown Kennard on faith alone. And you can see page three of my Salvation by Grace booklet for the complete quotation on that. Well, Garland Elkins is lined up against all these uh, Church of Christ outfits or whatever they are, papers, companies, people. Now, Alexander Campbell's salvation supports the truth on faith. Campbell obeyed the gospel, B.E. Howard says in a little booklet on the Church of Christ. We have over here. If he wants to see it or get the reference, I'll give it to him. On that, already given it two or three times. Alexander Campbell claimed salvation before baptism. Alexander Campbell's experience was one any Baptist church would have cheerfully received, we're told. Alexander Campbell was immersed later in 1812 by Baptist. Baptism in order to remission was not restored until 1827. Alexander Campbell was never baptized again after 1812. Therefore, Campbell's only hope of salvation was on the basis of his claim of salvation before Baptist baptism. Now let's look at another one here. Elkins proves faith alone. He only used Mark 16, 16a and six speeches to affirm his proposition on baptism. Yet he claimed last night Mark 16, 16 alone was enough. How many times does God have to say a thing he says? Does this mean he believes Mark 16, 16 only is the verse which supports his position? So I'll say the faith alone does not mean the faith only. Now look at the Blackbird Church here. Elkins Blackbird Church, application of charter and restoration principle. 
The blackbird is the sower. Campbell taught the truth and restored the church for preaching the gospel, says Elkins. Here's the acorn. Is the seed. Campbell's laws of the kingdom as seed in his Christianity restored book in the Millennial Harbinger magazine. That's the seed of the restoration movement. Now the oak tree is the fruit. It's restorationist. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooting up, rooted up. Now here's his bird chart, folks, and he's going to have blackbirds pie for a long time as this debate, I guarantee you. Now look at this one. Debating Memphis style. Now appearing at Camden Avenue Church of Christ. The Brother Logician Show, a four-night stand. We have a Ph.D., he defends God, and he dreams in syllogisms according to the spiritual soul. And here's the man saying, this intelligent audience knows I'm right. And here's the cheerleader, Mr. Taylor. Gentlemen moderators, Mr. Ross, and ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here before you again tonight. And I would suggest that in this particular speech, Mr. Ross has at least made an effort to say something about the Bible. And so therefore, I think perhaps this is his best speech. But at the same time, I would kindly and yet uh, definitely say that his speech is very easily answered. I'd like to have chart number 80. The issue in this debate as regards uh, Mr. Ross's proposition. Now, the issue is not, are men saved by the grace of God? Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, if, if the grace of God were the only thing involved, that would teach universal salvation. But there are conditions. The very next verse says that, if I wanted to take the time to quote it. Well, it's not, are men saved by faith? Now, I mentioned the synecdoche, where a part is put for a whole. Romans 5.1 is an example. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a word there specifically said about repentance. And yet my opponent believes that repentance is necessary. And so it is not an issue, are men saved by faith? But what is the issue? Well, here it is. The issue is... When are men saved by faith? Hebrews 11.30, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been compassed about for seven days. Now, when are men saved by faith? One, before that faith leads them to any act of obedience at all. That's what my opponent really affirms. Two, or after that faith has manifested itself in obedience to the word of God. Now, you know that I've contended all the way that it must be obedience. Two, by what kind of faith are men saved? Number one, by dead faith. Number two, by living faith. Chart number 81. All right, now my task as a negative speaker is number one, to show that the argument or arguments which Mr. Ross introduces, and of course if indeed he even introduces an argument, actually is this. I just suggest that it is to show that the arguments which he will introduce or does introduce does not prove his, Mr. Ross's, proposition. Number two, to set out negative arguments which prove his, that is, Mr. Ross's, proposition to be false. Chart number 82. Now, the fourth of Elkin's negative arguments. Number one, six basic negative arguments will be set out. Number two, any one. Now, it doesn't take six of them. Any one of these uh, six arguments will define Ross's proposition. Number three, any one of these arguments will refute um, Ross's proposition. Number three, but I, Elkins, will establish, prove all six of them. Now, on the next two charts, these six basic arguments will be listed. Then each one will be discussed in detail. All right, number one. The argument's listed. Since Ross's proposition implies that salvation is by a dead faith, is by dead faith, I, Elkins, will show that salvation is by a living faith. Number two, since salvation is in Christ, I will show that one does not believe into Christ. I'd like to have that passage. I've called for it before. It hasn't been forthcoming. Does not believe into Christ, but is baptized in Christ. To Christ. 
All right, number three. I will show that the force of the Bible use of the figure of speech, synecdoche, which puts the part for the whole, proves Ross's proposition to be false. Eighty-four. Number four. I will show that, since Ross's proposition demands that there can be no such thing as a believer who is not saved, the Bible teaches that some believers, that some believers are not saved. Number five. Since any proposition which implies a false doctrine is itself false, I will show that Ross's proposition implies false doctrine and is therefore false itself. Number six, since any proposition which implies a logical contradiction is itself false, I will show that Ross's proposition implies a logical contradiction and is therefore false itself. Now remember, I've given six, but any one of these six would be sufficient to refute Ross's proposition. Next chart. All right, question and argument number one. What does it mean to say, of faith, that it is dead, and the Greek given here? Well, number one, it means that it is destitute of life. Number two, it means that it is without life. Now, this is from Thayer on James 2.26, page 423 of his lexicon. Number two, what about dead faith? Well, since it is without life, it is powerless, inoperative, unable to accomplish anything at all. Number three, the conclusion. To affirm, as Ross does by implication in his proposition, that men are saved by dead faith is to affirm that which is false. All right, chart 86. And uh, negative arguments number one regarding salvation by dead faith. One, Ross's proposition stated, quote, the scripture states that salvation comes at the point of faith alone before and without any further acts of obedience. Number two, Ross's proposition analyzed. One, the scriptures teach. The scriptures do not explicitly teach Ross's proposition. B, so if the scriptures do teach this proposition at all, they must do it in the only other way possible. How is that? implicitly number two of the proposition that is continuing salvation comes at the point of faith alone before and without any further acts of obedience all right a salvation remission of sins b at the point of faith alone before and without any further acts of obedience and a under that this affirms that salvation is by faith before and without any further acts of obedience but b since faith without works is dead Mr. Ross's proposition affirms salvation by dead faith, and I've said that time and again. Now, a deadly parallel which answers what he said a few moments ago destroys Ross's proposition. <clears throat> James 2.26, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, even so faith apart from works is dead. Thus a deadly, notice this deadly parallel. Number one, the body plus the spirit equal a live man. Body minus the spirit equals a dead man. Number two, faith plus works equals a live faith. But faith minus works equals a dead faith. Now, friends, and I know there are many sincere Baptists who've never thought this thing through, Baptists teach salvation by a dead faith. Now, Ross's proposition teaches salvation by a dead faith, and it teaches it by implication. All right, the conclusion of Elkin's negative argument number one. One, if the Bible teaches that it is false that men are saved by dead faith, and if Ross's proposition teaches, either explicitly or implicitly, that men are saved by dead faith, then Ross's proposition is false. Two, the Bible teaches that it is false that men are saved by dead faith, and Ross's proposition teaches, by implication, that men are saved by dead faith. What is the conclusion? Therefore, Ross's proposition is false. Ross, my friend, is utterly defeated. The next chart. Now, Elkin's negative argument regarding salvation in Christ. Negative argument number two. Now, in the outer part of that circle, we have all men. And then we have in the next part of the circle, men out of Christ, but who are thus lost. And in the smaller circle, in Christ, we have it, men in Christ, thus saved. Now note, ladies and gentlemen, number one, salvation is in Christ. Second Timothy 2.10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ 
with eternal glory. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How then, number two, does one get into Christ? Not by believing without further acts of obedience. There is not a scripture in the word of God to teach such. It has not been produced in the last three nights. It will not be produced tonight. It cannot be produced because it does not exist. Number two, how do men get into Christ? By being baptized into Christ. In Romans 6, 1 through 4, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. How came them to be children of God by faith and in Christ Jesus? For as many of you as have passed it, been baptized into, into, into Christ, have put on Christ. All right? We're baptized. Sinners are baptized into Christ. All right? Chart number 90. Men are baptized into Christ, and therefore salvation being in Christ, People baptized into Christ, as I've just quoted the passage in Galatians, passage Galatians 3, 26 and 27. I therefore issue a challenge to Mr. Ross. Write in the following blank, and this is important. I hope he takes the number of this chart and complies therewith. Write in the following blank the passage which teaches that men believe into Christ. There it is it say, men believe into Christ. My friends, it does not say it. He cannot find it. I know just as much as I know that I'm here because I've read the Bible all of my life that it does not say believe into Christ. It doesn't say believe into Christ. It says we are baptized into Christ. It does not say believe into Christ. We are baptized into Christ. Let him deal with this. That's honorable debating. That's the kind of debating I want to do. All right, chart number 98. Elkins' negative argument, three, regarding the figure of speech, synecdoche. Number one, the definition of synecdoche. Quote, a figure of speech by which a part is put for the whole, or the whole is put for the part, etc. Here's an example. A cowboy might say, I have ten head of cattle. Now, do you believe that he is saying ten head? Do you think he is saying that he has one head and there are ten others out there? That there's some kind of floating around in the air? You know he is putting the part for the whole. Here's another illustration. The Bible says, quote, all the souls, now note, souls of the house, of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. Now, all the souls. This is another example of it. Now, in Romans, number two, in Romans 5, 1, I've already cited that. We are saved by faith, but it doesn't say a word about repentance, and yet this man contends that that does not eliminate repentance. Often people quote these passages, and I ask them, are you saying when you quote this passage that you are doing it to eliminate repentance? Well, they say, no, 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 it doesn't eliminate repentance. It doesn't eliminate baptism. <laughs> repentance unto life. Repentance unto life. Now then, if some of these passages that he has cited... If they mean, therefore, for this, uh, thank you. Therefore, he would have a man saved, since he teaches that repentance comes before faith. He would have a man. Oh, he couldn't have any faith. Why? He knows that's a synecdoche. First John two twenty three. He that confesses the Son hath the Father also. I mention all of the others in detail. First Peter three twenty one, which also asks a true likeness does now save you even baptism. Three. Now what will Ross do in, re in reply? One, if he denies it, he faces one dif difficulty. If he admits it, he faces another. Number 90B. All right, note this. Not all believers are saved. Now can Mr. Ross explain why? One, the Bible plainly teaches that fallen believers are not saved. One, John 8, 30 through 44. John 12, 42 through 43. Now two, what does Ross say about these? Believers of John 8, 30 through 44, are they saved or not saved? Listen, he didn't check anything. Let him tell us, and we'll know then where he stands on it, as if we do not already. But second, believers of John 12, 42 and 43 would not confess Christ. Jesus said, if you don't confess me, 
you will be condemned. I will not confess you before my Father. Let him tell us whether these believers of John 12, 42 and 43 were saved or not saved. Number three, we challenge Mr. Ross to give proof of answers to two above. Now, why is one believer saved and another not? Or does he believe that all believers are saved? All right, then continuing. Elkin's negative argument four regarding believers not saved. In Romans 10, 13 and 14, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, ladies and gentlemen, note carefully. The hearing came, the believing came before the calling. And the uh, calling came and salvation followed. Now, note, calling on the name of the Lord is an act of obedience which comes after believing, after believing, and before being saved. Therefore, no one is saved at the point of faith alone, before and without further acts of obedience. Therefore, Ross's proposition is false. Number 155. In verse 13, calling upon the name of the Lord comes before being saved. Verse 14, as I've quoted the passages, Believing in Christ comes before calling, before calling upon the name of Christ. Therefore, what is the conclusion? Men are not, are not saved at the point of faith alone before and without any further acts of obedience because calling on the name of the Lord comes after believing and before being saved. I wish he would call for that charge. I implore him. I think he owes it to you to deal with this matter. Therefore, of course, Ross's proposition is false. Now then, Elkin's negative argument number five. The, it is uh, correct to say that of the Bible that it teaches everything it says explicitly and everything that its explicit statements imply. The Bible teaches both and only, explicitly and implicitly. Two, to say that the Bible teaches something uh, implicitly is to say if proposition X implies proposition Y, then it is false to say that proposition X is true and proposition Y is false. Three, apply the above to Ross's preposition. One, if it is true that salvation comes at the port of faith alone before and without any further acts of obedience, then it is also true that he who believes and is not baptized shall be saved. Two, yet Ross uh, denies that it is true that he who believes and is not baptized shall be saved. Three, therefore, it is false that Salvation comes at the point of faith alone before and without any further acts of obedience. And then chart number 94. Now you'll note this. Number one, Ross's proposition in the debate implies that both haters of God are saved and are not saved. That's what the, the symbolism says. Number two, it is false that haters of God are saved and are not saved. Three, therefore, Ross's proposition in this debate is false. Now before my time is out, I want to answer his questions. And while I'm answering this question, I want to suggest that I do have the original Christ. And furthermore, the very, what you said did not mean the very part of the very first part of it. Note that Mr. Sam Morris said, we take the position that a Christian's sins do not damn his soul. The way a Christian lives, he can die drunk, he can die, die alive, he can die, die a fornicator. They take the, we take the position that a Christian sins do not damn his soul. The way a man lives, what he says, his character, his conduct, or attitude toward other people have nothing whatever to do with the salvation of his soul. And there's much more, much more. For example, he says that all the sins, all the sins he may commit from idolatry to murder will not make his soul in any more danger. Now, I believe Mr. Ross is better than his doctrine. If he believed this doctrine, it would be dangerous to live nearby. I don't think he practices the part of the doctrine that Sam Morris said he could, and I'm glad he does not. Ladies and gentlemen, there is perhaps no doctrine that could be discussed that is more dangerous and more repulsive to those who know the Bible and rightly divide the Bible than this. Now, in the last uh, moment or so that I have, I want to continue then with chart 150. More on Elkin's negative argument, number four. Please turn.
more detailed analysis of John 8, 30 through 44. Number one, Elkin's argument stated, one, if Ross's proposition is true, then it is false that there can be a lost believer. Now, this is self-evident. Two, but there can be a lost believer. John 8, 30 through 44, proved on chart 151. Three, therefore, Ross's proposition is false. Number two, a detailed look at John 8, 30 through 44. John 8, 30, as he spake those words, many believed on him. But down in verse 44, he said to these people, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father it is your will to do. All right, one, John 8, 30, many believed on him. The word believed, and here's the Greek, as active indicative, this means that they actually believe to on him. And then three, uh, in 16 and 18. And then note further, in John number two, John 8, 44, he still said, ye are of your father, the devil. My friends, this is conclusive. If nothing else had been said in this debate, his proposition goes down, of course. And I am hoping that he will pay some attention to this. And I appreciate the fact that tonight we're going to get more to the issues. That's the kind of debating I like to do. I believe that that's the kind of the debating that we should do. Thank you very much. Start my time. Oh, well, don't start my time. Sorry. Do a speech without any hands law. I'll get one call if I don't hurt now, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, I like Garland. He's a likable fellow. I know I've said some hard things in the debate and all, but I'm sincere and honest when I say that he's a likable fellow. And I know that if you know him, you agree with him. And I don't, I don't like to browbeat or cudgel a man, but... I must say, for the benefit of this audience, that he did not follow my speech. I'm in the affirmative. The negative speecher, speaker is to follow the affirmative speaker and to deal with the arguments that he presents. Now, I could follow him in all these charts and go right down the line and refute the chart. He's already flashed several of them up here during the course of the debate, and I have commented about some points about them, but I'm not going to get drug off of the route that I've laid out for myself. But now, I really, I really think that the reason Garland has not followed my speech is he just can't deal with the material that's presented at the moment, so he has to come up with his, what he calls a brown and serve speech. And so he has these charts that all these fellows here Mr. Warren, Mr. Meredith, uh, the young Taylor man, and Mr. Varner, and anybody else that's here that's happening, they get together, and they put all this so he'll have something to say when he comes to the platform, and even when he's in the negative. I thought surely when he got the negative, he'd pay attention to some things I was saying. But he didn't deal with the arguments I presented. He didn't deal with the charts. And he didn't even, didn't even read and answer the questions publicly. Well, that was for your benefit that uh, he could have done so. He wrote them down and handed them to me. That's all right. But I thought at least he'd want you to get his answer to them since I gave the question out. But he's really got himself in a jam with these questions. I don't know if he wrote the answers or Mr. Warren. I have an opinion. I didn't really look when it was going on, but I have an opinion. But I don't want to be too hard on Garland. But I must present the facts. Now, this is the kind of debating that's going on. And uh, young Mr. Taylor here, he's the one that writes these articles about them and tells them how great they are in the spiritual soul. He talks about the great fellowship with the sublime three at a conference. And, and he just, I'm telling you, it's a mutual admiration society that you wouldn't believe unless you read the spiritual soul. And then Garland pats Taylor on the back and says what a great writer he is for some broadcast, I think, World Radio that he works for. Well, now, that's the kind of uh, debating that we're getting here, and I'm sorry that it's that way, but such as it is. Now, let's go on to something else here. James Bales on repentance. This is from the spiritual soul, and I'm presenting this because it eats right into the hands of my affirmative. Repentance is the change from I will not to I will. 
It is the change of mind which results in the redirection of life. Now, that's his definition. He says we need to repent and accept Christ in order to be new creatures in Christ. Now, that sounds like Baptist doctrine uh, to Baptist. But let's go on here and consider something. Hence, restorationist faith, which precedes repentance, does not accept Christ. Now, you see that? They put faith before repentance. They put faith before repentance. Now, a lot of Baptist people don't understand this because we teach the Bible repent and believe. But they put faith before repentance, and here's what this man says. Repent and accept Christ in order to be new creatures. So, restoration is faith which precedes repentance does not accept Christ. Now, do you see it? And he's got it right here on the answers to these questions. I want, you to, I want to read these to you. If faith before baptism is a lie, as you asserted on Thursday night, at what point did faith before baptism become a lie? Now I want you to get this. Here's his answer. At its first act of obedience, repentance. You see, even his faith is not obedience because it's dead and it's not obeyed, the first act of obedience is repentance. He says the faith before repentance is dead. Listen to this. Is the faith which obeys the command to believe alive or dead when it obeys that command? All right, now here's the command. Believe. Now, a man responds and he believes. Is it dead faith or living faith? Here's his answer. Faith without works is dead. So that man who obeys the command to believe and he doesn't have any other works, he says faith without works is dead, quoting James chapter 2, as if James 2 condemned a man for obeying the Lord and believing. God commands a man to believe, but Elkin says when he obeys that command, he doesn't have any works yet, and so James chapter 2 condemns him for believing. That's the spiritual sword being turned on him, Brother Larry, the Bible. The spiritual sword piercing him right through like I had it drawn on the picture the other night, just piercing him down. I said that he's going to choke on faith, and he's choking on it right now. Does James chapter 2 condemn the faith which obeys the command to believe before any other act of obedience, including repentance and confession? Get this. It simply recognizes it as dead. So the faith Mr. Elkins had before repentance, James chapter 2 recognizes the faith he had as dead. He admits it. He admits that James chapter 2 recognizes the faith he had before repentance as dead. Well, he agrees with me then. That's what I've been saying all along, that the man preaches a dead faith. And he's been denying it. But I knew just as well when he started backing away from McGarvey's position that James 2 was just one like a spiritual sword right through it. Now get it, folks. I want, I want to bear down on it. Restoration is faith which precedes repentance does not accept Jesus Christ and according to Garland Elkins or whoever wrote these questions out, James 2 recognizes it as David. You see now why he uh, puts his charts up here and talks over that way, trying to lead me off. Why he talks about Sam Morris. So, oh, by the way, you didn't say whether or not you wanted to debate the whole track, did you? You still want to leave the dots out and debate that, but what about the whole track? I'll debate the whole track with you. Now, folks, this is the death knell in this debate right here. This is what we've been working for. I told Larry... The other day I said about the third or fourth night it's all over because by that time they've come to choke to death on faith. This is why restorationists say they're children of the devil before baptism because they do not know what it is to trust Jesus Christ with a living faith before baptism. That's why they admit to being children of the devil in the spiritual sword, January of 74. The author, I think it was Mr. Warren right on the inside cover, said that men are still children of the devil until they're baptized. Well, in other words, folks, when you come down this aisle here at Camden Avenue, Church of Christ, 
and brother, uh, who's the uh, brother Pew? Take your hand and you make the good confession. You say, brother Pew, I have repented. Brother Pew, I believe before I repent. Brother Pew, I am wanting to obey the Lord and be baptized. Brother Pew is obligated to say to you and to ask you or at least to clear it up. Uh, you're not saved, are you? No. You're not a child of God, are you? No. You're a child of the devil, aren't you? Yes. You had dead faith before repentance, didn't you? Yes. Okay, since you're a child of the devil and you had dead faith before repentance, and all this and your faith did not accept Jesus Christ, then we'll baptize I think they ought to put on a, a magic show here and advertise it how that they turn children of the devil into children of God through the magic of the baptistry. That's what I think they should do. Now, look at this. Here's the truth about repentance and the restoration movement doctrine. Unbelief, according to Baal, uh, in repentance you have a change of mind. So a change of mind from unbelief would be a change to belief, wouldn't it? If you're an unbeliever and you change your mind, then you become a believer. But look at the restoration era about this. They say you believe or have belief, and then you have a change of mind, and you change from believing to unbelieving. Now, folks, if I have faith, and then I change my mind, what do I change it to? Unbelief. That's exactly what he's got, what they have here in their doctrine on repentance and faith. How many? Now look at this. And he's never dealt with this. I, I've had it up here. And by the way, he should have been reading those verses on baptism two nights ago. You folks that weren't here Monday and Tuesday night, all you missed was one verse and half of that, Mark 16, 16a, was presented in the half of what you believe if you believe in the proposition this man had. For six speeches... He tried to prove it, and he tried to go to Baptist scholars to prove it. And then last night I read A.T. Robertson and took A.T. Robertson away from him. And then he got up here and questioned the integrity of A.T. Robertson. I have a chart here on that, and I want to uh, put that up if I can find it. Here it is. I'll get to this later. Most of you already seen that. But look at this. Elkins impeaches the integrity of A.T. Robertson. He accuses Robertson of being double-tongued. If Robertson speaks as, number one, a scholar, as Elkins says, and as a Baptist on the, out of the other side of the mouth, as Elkins implies, and Elkins won't accept number two part of Robinson, then let's look at it. He says, as a scholar, he tells the truth. But as the Baptist, he just utters his prejudices. That was the gist of what he had in reply to my quote from Robertson. All right, now, Garland, if men do that, what about you? Are you any different from Robertson? Let's just apply this to Garland Elkins. Elkins is not a scholar, and we can't accept one's integrity in Category 2 here because he'll be preaching or writing from prejudice of his religion. Then we can't accept, accept Elkins on anything. You see, he's not a scholar, and when he talks as a Church of Christ preacher, he's just uttering his prejudice as a Church of Christ preacher, so we can't accept him on anything. That's how he tried to answer A.T. Robertson when I took Robertson away from him last night by quoting to you from his commentary on Mark 16, 16, where he repudiated the doctrine of this man on baptism. I'd be ashamed to deal with scholars and say, well, now, they'll tell the truth when they're scholars, but when they get back on home ground doctrine and all that, well, you can't trust them. Well, I wouldn't even use a man that was double-tongued like that. I, I don't have any use for men that will tell the truth here and lie over here. I've heard people say, well, Jesus was a good man, but he made some mistakes. Well, why listen to him then? If Robertson won't tell the truth about things, why listen to him? Now back to this one. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Ten dollars, if Elkin says yes, I've offered it to him night after night. And by the way, we went out and played golf again today. And guess what? A good Baptist man paid the whole green fee. You know, Mr. Elkins gave me $5 the other day. He didn't know what I was going to use it for, but he just paid a part of the green fee. I thought, how, how parallel this is to Baptist doctrine and Church of Christ doctrine. They want to do half of it and God do the rest, but a Baptist, you just get it all free. The Lord provides it all. 
Now look at this. Here's the spiritual sword doctrine about baptism before sinners before baptism. They're handcuffed, they're wearing the leg irons of the devil, they're in balls of chains, and they're in the prison house of Lucifer. Now I'd like to know how in the world can a man repent when he's in that condition? How in the world can a man have any life when he's that kind of condition? But that's the fellow. They get him out of jail and bring him down here to Camden Avenue, I suppose, and baptize him. That's what they do. They get him out of Satan's jailhouse and bring him down here, and he's not a bit better off spiritually than he was when he started. Now let's see what else I can put up here for any other restorationist who might like to accept my offer. <clears throat> he that believeth in the restoration movement and can give book, chapter, and verse for it shall receive $10. Ask him, the preacher, to give you the book, chapter, and verse, Garland Elkin says in his little booklet, Come and See, page 8. If it's not taught in the Word of God, it must be a lie. Now where is the verse for the restoration movement which this man says restored his church, the Church of Christ, which uh, he claims to be a part of. Then look at this one. Elkin says he's not saved. Save us in heaven. I want to be saved, he said Monday night in his speech. He confesses to having false and foolish ways, and so is he lost? I'm pointing out some of these false and foolish ways to him in this debate. And I'm going to keep grinding him on this faith matter, uh, his faith being dead at its inception. He's admitted that right here. He says it's dead before repentance now. But it becomes alive, he thinks, at repentance. He needs the correction of the word. I think this prayer is probably being answered in this debate. Now, all right, now look at this. What kind of a plant is Garland Elk? Thomas Warren, before baptism, Elkins was a child of the devil, according to Warren. Now in the Bible, children of the devil, they equal the seed of the devil. That's in Matthew 13. They're the children of Satan. They're the seed. Number three, Elkins teaches that seed planted produces after its kind. What then is Garland Elkins? You intelligent people know the answer. Don't. How many minutes? Now, let me show you this again for the benefit of those that weren't here last time. Folks, this restoration doctrine that he's saddled with through his writings in the spiritual sword, it has really been the egg on his face throughout this debate. He's affirmed a proposition that was restored, he says, by Alexander Campbell. And he's affirmed you get into a church through obedience to that proposition, which was restored by Alexander Campbell. And I pointed out that Campbell himself said he was saved before baptism. Then he got baptized by a Baptist preacher. Then later on they found out that baptism was for the remission of sins. And then he didn't get baptized after he found that out. And so what, does this, what kind of predicament does this leave them in when they say Campbell obeyed the truth? I guess it means that you get saved before baptism and then you go to a Baptist preacher and then if you find out that baptism is for the remission of sins, you don't get baptized for the remission of sins. That's Campbell obeying the truth. And this man said, Campbell restored the truth, he preached the truth. V.E. Howard said he obeyed the gospel. But this restoration doctrine is going to be egg on his face. He's going to have blackbird pie. He's going to have blackbird feathers sticking out all over him as a result of this debate. Now look at this. Here are these buzzers that we saw one of them up at Buffalo Creek when we went up there the other day. And they're the ones that laid the egg for this restoration movement. He talks about this black bird dropping an acorn down. I put that chart up there, didn't I? Well, that was Alexander Campbell that laid the egg or placed the acorn. And when you plant a Campbell acorn, what comes up? They don't like to be called Campbellite, but J.D. Tant. J.D. Tant said that slogan, we speak where the Bible speaks, and it's in one of these booklets. He said that that was Campbellism. came from Thomas Campbell. I didn't say it. J.D. Tant did. If you don't like it, blame him. He's the preacher. Father of the Yater Tant, I think it is, or Tater Yant, or whichever way you say that. Now, Mr. Elkins thought it was an acorn. No! It was an egg. It was a seed uh, in the form of an egg. All right, and it's hatching all over the place. And it's the tares that the scripture talks about if you want a comparison. 
in this spiritual sword, it's proved to be neither spiritual nor a sword in this debate. That has furnished me with my best reputation of him and the greatest support of my own affirmative proposition. Now, he hasn't even dealt with my first speech. That's why that I'm not, I haven't gone on with any more in continuation of what I had planned. In following, I wanted to get these things out and refute what he'd answered here about faith because this just chokes him to death, these questions. I'm going to bring this back in my next speech. Look at this, folks. Let's go on a little bit further here. If faith is not alive at its earliest inception, does James 2 condemn faith at its earliest inception? Faith without works is dead. So I guess faith at its earliest inception is dead. But J.D. Bale said that faith is the highest work man can do. I have this quoted in my little book that you passed out. And yet this man says that faith without work. Listen, faith is a work itself, John 6, 28 and 29. Faith is a work itself. It's God's work on God's side and it's man's work on man's side. What may we do that we may work the work of God? This is the work of God that you believe. But Elkin says, as soon as that work starts, it's dead. It's dead. In its earliest inception, it's dead. And yet God commands a man to have dead things at its earliest inception. How in the world can a person believe such a doctrine as that? And offer that as obedience to the gospel. That as much as a saying that I have to have dead faith in order to have life. Yes. If a man came down this aisle and said, I have dead faith, well, I guess Mr. Pugh would have to say, well, go get that faith killed and get it dead, then we can take it. Well, if you walk down this aisle and said, I already have a faith that's already alive. Well, no, we can't take you because that's condemned to James 2. James 2 condemns that because that kind of faith is what we believe is dead faith. Thank you. we'd like to continue. Gentlemen, are you ready? All right. It is now time for the negative speaker, Mr. Elkins. I turn the platform over to Mr. Elkins. Mr. Moderators, Mr. Ross, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here again to speak in denial of the affirmation that you have just heard. And I'd like to call for a deadly parallel chart that I have introduced before because it answers everything that he said. Now I want you to know, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, even so faith apart from works is dead. James 2.26. Now listen, that's Bible teaching. Now thus, this is the deadly parallel. A body plus a spirit equal a live man. But the body minus the spirit equal a dead man. In Acts 9.39, about Dorcas, the Bible said, While she was with us. Now, something had left that body, but that was a dead body. And listen, friends, you could come no nearer riding, for example, a dead horse to a river than you can ride a dead face to heaven. Now, my opponent preaches a dead faith. He can say anything he wants to, any time he wants to. But that's exactly what it amounts to. Now, the Bible teaches faith plus works equal a live faith. Faith minus works teaches a dead faith. Now, Mr. Ross teaches salvation by a dead faith. He teaches, in fact, his proposition affirms such a dead faith. Faith plus works equal a live faith. Faith minus work equal a dead faith. Mr. Ross teaches salvation by a dead faith. Therefore, Ross's proposition teaches salvation by a dead faith by implication. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again I say that answers everything that he had to say on that. Now, he made you think, uh, tried to make you think that he had answered that, but you know what's been discussed in this debate. This will go into the book. You can read it for yourself. 
All right, can we have the next chart? Notice on this particular chart, in John 8, we have this uh, continuation of John 8, 30, shows that some believers are lost. Now, if John uh, 8, 30 through 44 teaches that Jesus addressed, now notice, as children of the devil, children of the devil, those who had already believed on him, then there can be such thing as a lost, but notice, a lost believer, a lost believer. But in John 8, 30 through 44, Jesus teaches, the Bible teaches, Jesus addressed as children of the devil those who already believed on him. Believed on him. All right, number three. Therefore, there can be such a thing as a lost believer. There can be such a thing. And we have Bible example of it in the very words of Christ as a lost believer. Now note, number one, the argument is valid. Number two, the premises are true. Thus, the conclusion is true. Thus, premise two of the argument on chart number 150 has been proved. Thus, Ross's proposition is false. The next chart. On John 12, 42 and 43. Now, on that matter of dead faith a few moments ago. Now, Jesus, it is said of these people that they believed on him. But they had a dead faith. A dead faith. They would not confess him. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, If you will not confess me, I will not confess you before my Father which is in heaven. These people believed on him. They would not confess him. They would not confess him. Therefore, we have an example here of some believers, but this faith was a dead faith. Now, that's the kind of faith that he is advocating. Now, note in John 12, 42, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. But, notice, negative, imperfect, in contrast to the punctiliar Aris belief. That is, they kept on not, they kept on not believing on him. Now, it'd be interesting for him to tell us whether they can be saved or not, whether they were saved or not. Let him tell us about John. 12, 42, and 43. I've brought it up a number of times. He has never told us about it. Now, note. One, here are believers, as, of course, to express the fact, as such, that did confess their faith. But remember, those who deny Christ, those who deny Christ, will be not denied by Christ. Matthew 10, 32, and 33. Now, note further. They love the glory of men more than the glory of God. But if a man love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema, the Bible says, in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. And uh, so therefore we discuss that. But now John 12, 42 and 43 shows that some believers are lost. Here's the proof of it. I've missed it, but let's get it down so you can see it. One, if John 12, 42 and 43 teaches that some believers, notice, kept on not confessing Christ, then there can be such a thing as a lost believer. 2 John 12, 42 and 43 teaches that some believers kept on not confessing him. Therefore, therefore, note this, there be, there is such a thing as a lost believer. Let him deal with John 12, 30, 42 and 43. Now then, an argument which refutes uh, Ross's proposition. One, if Ross's proposition is true, then it is false that there can be a lost believer. All right, number two, but there can be a lost believer, and I've just proved that from the Bible. John 12, 42 and 43, and proof on chart number 152. What is the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen? Therefore, Ross's proposition is false. Therefore, it is clear beyond any shadow of doubt that Baptist doctrine is false. Now, there are many honest people who are in the Baptist church who do not know about these things, haven't thought about them, but Baptist doctrine is false, and friends, of course, you should renounce it. But again... Ross's statement turns back on him. One, if faith is alive from its very inception, then there can be no such thing as dead faith. Two, if there can be no such thing as a dead faith, then there can be no such thing as a lost believer. But there can be a lost believer, and I've just shown that. John 8, 30 through 44. John 12, 42 and 43. Number four, therefore. Now listen. Therefore... There can be such a thing as a dead faith. Therefore, it is false that faith is alive from its very inception. James 2, 26. Now note, first, this argument is valid. 
two, all the premises are true. And three, the conclusion, of course, is true. But now note again on Romans 10, 13 and 14. How much did he say about that? For whosoever shall uh, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now notice this argument. I know that you can understand it. I hope that he'll deal with it. Notice, hearing, believing, and then comes the calling, but they're still not saved. Hearing, believing, calling, saved. Hearing, believing, calling, saved. Now note, calling on the name of the Lord is an act of obedience, which comes after believing and before being saved. I tell you, friends, this debate will end. This man will not even mention this scripture by way of taking it up and trying to analyze it. Now then, he is obligated to do it, but he won't do it. I do not believe. I hope he proves me wrong. Now note, therefore no one is saved at the point of faith alone before and without further acts of obedience. Therefore, Ross's proposition is false. But again, more on Elkin's uh, negative. Note verse 13, calling upon the name of the Lord comes before, you know, just like the other night, when we were talking about the fact he that believeth and is baptized came before, shall be saved. Well, it's the same thing here. Calling upon the name of the Lord comes before one is saved, before being saved. In verse 14, believing in Christ comes before calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, what is the conclusion? Therefore, men are not saved at the point of faith alone, before and without any further acts of obedience, because calling on the name of the Lord comes after believing, but comes after believing and before, where does calling come? It comes after believing and before what? Before salvation. Therefore, Ross's proposition is false. All right, let us note then chart 8 and 9. Notice the large circle. All men are uh, represented here, uh, all men in, in uh, this great circle here. And in the next place, men out of Christ, thus lost. And then men in Christ, thus saved. Now note, salvation is in Christ. I've given the passages before. Here they are. And number two, the question, how then does one get into Christ? Now, not by believing, without further acts of obedience. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I have begged, I have pleaded, I have implored. I would do anything that's right to get him to find the passage that says that a sinner believes in to Christ. Where is the passage that says that? Where is the passage? Now, if he can find it, I will accept it. Now then, I can find the passage that tells us how we get into Christ, and let's note the next. Let's note the next. Note how then do we get into Christ? Not by believing without further acts of obedience. There's no scripture for that. But at the same time, but by being baptized into Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 5 through 5, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. But the next chart. Let us note, men are baptized into Christ. Now then, I again point out that we're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ. That is, from the outside to the inside. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now notice, a salvation is in Christ. Here's a challenge to Ross. Let him write in the following blank the passage that teaches, the passage which teaches that men believe in the Christ. Now if he can do it, if he can find it, if he wants to end this debate and go back to Texas early, well then let him do it. Let him find it. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, there have been men trying for years and they cannot find it. Now then, let's have the next chart. You know, he's had a great deal to say about Alexander Campbell. And we've uh, referring to members of the Church of Christ as Campbellites. In fact, instead of defending the proposition that he signed to affirm, he's been out here talking about movements and men. Now, the point I would accept is this. If there was not a Christian in all of this world, not a single Christian in all of this world, and if someone came in contact with a copy of the New Testament 
and they read that, believed that, and obeyed that, the seed produces after its, its kind. He can make all kind of ridicule of it, but listen, he cannot set this thing aside. The truth about the matter is, and I say this with kindness, when a person refers to a Christian as a Campbellite, I cannot but think of two reasons as to why. Number one, he is not informed. Ignorance. But Mr. Ross has read widely on this subject, as you can tell. Number one, he is not informed. Or number two, a man who would do that is deliberately attacking those and those with whom they stand, the church of the Lord, by using such a designation. When I refer to Mr. Ross as Baptist, I refer to him by the name that he calls himself. I noticed in a Baptist paper in very fine print, they announced this debate. They said Mr. Bob L. Ross... Baptist of Pasadena, Texas, will debate Mr. Garland Elkin of Memphis, Tennessee, Campbellite. Campbellite. You notice how many times this is put in, but now note on this. Notice, number one, that the seed is the Word of God, Luke 8, 11. When that is dropped, suppose a blackbird flew across the ground, dropped an acorn in there, and into the good soil, Luke 8, 15. Now question, what would this be? Would it produce an oak tree or would it produce a bird? We've been here several nights and he has not until this good hour discussed those matters by way of, of checking up there. And so let's see the next chart because this is on the same thing. Notice on the next chart that the power of the word and the restoration principle. Now, Ross, Mr. Ross, please answer. Please answer. The plant which results from the seed, the word of God is... A child of God or a child of the devil? Now then, note, Luke 8, 11, the seed is the word of God. Now, what does the planting of the seed of the word of God result in? A child of God or a child of the devil? Now then, the seed of Jones, what would that result in? Would that result in a child of Smith or would it result in the uh, child of Jones? Now, will Mr. Ross dare to honestly answer these questions? Or will he continue to misrepresent the restoration principle? And then let us take the next. On this, on this chart, as we continue with this matter, let us note the power of the seed. I can hold in my hand enough seed, in one hand, in fact, to provide lumber to build a city if given time to grow in good soil. I can hold enough wheat in one hand to feed the world if given time to grow in good soil. Number two, just so it is with the seed, which is the word of God, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Hebrews 4 and verse 12, the word of God is living and active. Here in Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I did not even know who Alexander Campbell was until I was practically grown because my folk had taught me the Bible. They taught me not something that some man had originated out here, I believe the Bible. I was a child of God before I even knew Alexander ever existed. Alexander Campbell ever existed. And if we... All right, thank you very much. Now note here, an illustration. What if one Christian in the... Up just a little. One Christian in the USA, there was only one, but one or more people learned the truth and obeyed it. Now what would it make them? It would make them what the sea. What did it make in the first century? It would make exactly what it has always made. All right, now that's all that is meant by the term, the restoration principle. Now I want to get something also into this discussion. I want to read a statement from Mr. Ross's book, and it's on page 86, and it's under Campbell-like interpretation refuted. He says, and I'm quoting, it is not difficult for a born-again believer to understand that baptism has nothing to do with the saving of the soul. And then again on page 97, and he says, Yes, Baptists truly believe that the person who trusts Christ and is baptized shall be saved, and we also believe that the person who trusts Christ and has not yet been baptized shall be saved. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want us to look one more time at this particular chart. The Bible teaches us that salvation is in Christ. In 2 Timothy 2.10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus 
with eternal glory. All right, the Bible says we are baptized into Christ. Now, he could live as old as Methuselah, if that were possible, and he could never find where it says we believe into Christ. If he would only take up that point, I beg him to take up that point. Why is he so fearful of that point? It says we're baptized into Christ. It says we're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says, For you are all the children of God by faith, but where? In Christ Jesus. Now, how came them to be children of God by faith in Christ Jesus? For as many of you as have been, past tense, have been baptized into Christ. Ye are, ye are what? Children of God by faith. Where are you children of God? In Christ Jesus. How came you to be children of God? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. If he would merely tell us how to get into Christ and cite the verse that says that we believe into Christ. Now, he had a great deal to say about the fact that of faith and when it was dead and all of those kind of things, but remember this, friends, that he teaches repentance comes before faith. Now, if that be true, he would have a man born again before he ever believes. But in Acts 2.36, when Peter said, Therefore let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, then he, if he is a typical Baptist, teaches that repentance follows in the next verse, where he said, they said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now listen, he cannot clear up these contradictions and blunders an absolute rejection of the truth of God except by one way. Now, he suggested, for example, that he had uh, no ill will toward me or words like that, though he said I'm the devil, worse than the devil, a puppet and all of that, but I certainly have no ill will toward him. I think that he could be a man who could do tremendous, tremendous good if he would be baptized into Christ, obey the gospel. Be baptized into Christ. Now then, if he tells me, you need to believe into Christ, let him produce the passage. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Now then, if he can find the passage that says that we are to believe, sinners are to believe into Christ, I will believe it because the Bible is right. Now listen, I did not write this. Paul said... For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The Bible says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, thank you very much. You may start my time. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure addressing you Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and now Friday in this debate. I appreciate the attendance of both the Baptist people and others, the Methodist, Presbyterian, or whatever. appreciate the attendance of the Church of Christ people. I appreciate the hospitality of this church and having this debate. I appreciate being in a debate with Mr. Elkins, Mr. Meredith, his moderator, Mr. Pugh and Mr. Varner working together and sponsoring the debate, and of course I appreciate working with my moderator and the men who have helped. Um, again, I'll affirm my respect for Garland Elkins as a man, a man I think ha who is a likable man, a good personality, and a man no doubt who is dedicated and sincere in his work. But so far as our theological or religious differences are concerned, I stand firm, firmer than ever, for that matter, in coming to the conclusion of this debate. And I also uh, stand with regard to the debate that I have, my, my efforts in the debate, I have probably had less effort in this debate than any debate I've ever had so far as having to deal with Scripture on the part of the affirmative. He gave Mark 16, 16a. He never gave Acts 238. 
He never gave any other verse in Acts, Romans, wherever. And uh, so in the, in the affirmative, I've never had any more, an easier time because he hasn't followed my affirmative arguments. He's up here with his charts, which were brown and served charts to borrow his terminology. And uh, one thing Garland did do in the debate, I don't know if he's responsible or someone else is responsible, but he did add a few cartoons to the charts and that made it a little bit more interesting. I would hate to have to look up there at those symbols of logic and just the black writing and all that throughout this debate without some little inkling of humor like a bird flying through the air with an acorn or Ross's feet to the fire or Ross with his beard and those things. So that's a one positive thing in the debate that I have to say that was a good on his part. And I will say this, and no reflection necessarily on Mr. Warren, but I do believe that Garland could have done a better job if he said he didn't know Mr. Warren was going to come to the debate until a few days before he came. Garland, if you had slipped out of Memphis without him coming, I think you would have done a better job in this debate. But I'm afraid that Mr. Warren had hijacked the plane and got on there and came on up here anyway. And I think that's hurt him having to read all these things that Mr. Warren was preparing. I believe Garland probably prepared to debate up until the time he knew that Warren was coming and then he kind of scrapped his effort. Now inasmuch as he has brought in the word cannibalism with some significance, which I really haven't in the debate, but he... he <laughs> I don't, I don't recall using the word abusively in any way any more than Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterian. For some reason, when you say camelism or camelite, uh, the hair just wrinkles on the neck. But I'd say Presbyterian or Lutheran or Wesleyan, and it doesn't bother those people. Why are you so paranoid about the word camelism? Look at here. A Church of Christ preacher answered. Now, this is not Bob Ross Garland. This is not Bob L. Ross. Y'all say, oh, you're calling me a Camelite. This is J.D. Tan. I've got the book over here if you want it. We speak where the Bible speaks and are silent where the Bible is silent. He says Thomas Campbell said that. This is Campbellism. J.D. Tan in a book called The Gospel X-Ray, page 65. Now, Campbellism is equal to the Restoration Movement, according to what Tan is implying here, because... He defends the Church of Christ in this particular book here. And Garland and Alan Hires and Roy Devers and Rubel Shelley and all these men say that the Restoration Movement and the Church of Christ are the same thing. So when you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into the Restoration Movement according to the Spiritual Sword magazine. Because the Spiritual Sword magazine teaches that the Restoration Movement is the Church of Christ and salvation is in Christ, and Christ is in the church, so you're baptized into Christ. Now, he said that he would like to baptize me, or I could do great good if I were baptized. Words to that effect. Well, now, God and I have been baptized into Christ. The word into is ace or ice. And I have been baptized ace Christ. I have believed even ace Christ. This little word into, he's made an argument on, it's only an English translation, and he knows it, and it does nothing to support his argument that you never believe into Christ, that you're baptized into Christ. Nothing whatsoever. I quoted John 3.18, which he won't deal with that. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Now, Garland, you tell us, does a man get baptized on Christ? He that believeth on the Son hath life. Does a man get baptized on Christ? You see, you can't get baptized on Christ, so how are you going to get on Christ? Come on now, think about it, folks. He that believeth on the Son is not condemned. He that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and you can't get baptized on it. What in the world is he going to do for salvation? He's run into a dead end with his water. <laughs> he has no place to go with his water. 
He can't get on Christ for no condemnation because he can't get baptized on Christ. Now that's about as strong an argument as your little argument about into. Using an English word as if it was implying some teaching of the Bible that's in the Greek or in the meaning of the passage. But he said he wanted to baptize Ross so he could do great good. I think Ross might be doing great good right here. I think Ross might be affirming the word of God in the hearts of people here that it's not going to be a bird dropping an acorn garland, but it's going to be the Holy Spirit enlightening people to your heresy and the heresy of this church and the other heresy of the restoration movement so that they'll never want another debate in this church where the man knows anything about cannibalism and the restoration movement. I firmly believe that they have had the last debate they'll want for a while in this church about the restoration movement because you have utterly failed to uphold it, your proposition, and Alexander Campbell. Now, when he tried to bring in Robertson, I rebuked him for it. He didn't apologize. He didn't refute this. He just went right on with his charts. Now, Garland, you ought to apologize to the Baptist for your accusing A.T. Robertson of being a double-tongued man. But back to this thing on faith now. Look here. He refutes McGarvey, and the other night when I brought in McGarvey, he very qui uh, quietly and kind of in a tiptoe-like manner, he wanted to dissociate himself from McGarvey. Why? Faith is dead until the believer is immersed. J.W. McGarvey is a restoration giant, folks. Now, Elkins over here, at best, in this debate, has been Warren's puppet. And I don't apologize for using that because although it's figurative, it's ha almost been literal because he stood here and read charts and read arguments and the man's over there writing right now something for him to say when he gets back up here. I guarantee you, this man right here is writing and he's going to get up here and read it. I try to think for myself in the debate. I appreciate the help Larry has given me because he has given some. But you don't find him over there doing my thinking and doing the writing and preparing the charts and all that. I wouldn't debate if I had to debate that way. But Elkins, at the insistence of Warren, because Warren had a debate book that he wanted to flash up here on the wall to show that they don't teach, as Warren says, that faith before baptism is dead. Elkins got up here and said, faith is not dead before baptism, and contradicted J.W. McGarvey, which would make this man here look like a pygmy in the Restoration Movement. And you folks that know anything about your history or your commentaries, you know that's the truth. This man right here is a Restoration giant, so far as the respect he's had in the movement's concerned, as compared to these men in this debate. So Elkins, therefore, at Warren's behalf, repudiates the doctrine of faith taught by McGarvey and other restorationists. But we commend him for doing so because McGarvey himself is just as wrong as Elkins in the whole restoration movement with him. Now, here's the great mystery. We finally solved it, didn't we? He answered my questions. He didn't read those questions to you. He didn't comment on my comment about those questions when I used them in the pulpit a while ago. He has said nothing about the questions to you or my answers to those questions because he can. That's the simple truth of the matter. When does faith become alive? Mr. Elkin said, in answer to my questions, it came alive at repentance right here. Am I pointing at it right, Larry? Can't tell looking down here. You can't look behind my head to see if it's doing all right. Right here. At repentance. Now over here, I blotted this out so that uh, this would be uh, just dead faith all the way through to repentance, you see. Now this is faith on this side of repentance. What kind of faith does Garland Elkins say that people have in the Church of Christ before they repent? Dead faith. Now they're the ones that put faith before repentance, and they say it's dead. So when Garland Elkins had faith, he had a faith that James 2 recognized as dead, and therefore he is under the condemnation of James chapter 2 and not we as Baptists, because we do not have the dead faith of James chapter 2. 
We have a living faith that trusts and obeys Jesus Christ. In James chapter 2, it's talking about that kind of a dead faith that does not trust Jesus Christ. It's the kind of faith that devils have. Now, he was up here the other night saying, Ross said that all kinds of faith is the same as that in John 3.18. He had John 3.18 on a chart and said, Ross has all the, the faith is all alike. Well, now, friends, that is simply not so. The faith of devils does not trust Christ. And Mr. Elkins said that that's dead faith, according to James 2. And Mr. Elkins says that faith before repentance is dead, and it's just like the faith of devils. So Mr. Elkins had the same kind of faith as devils before he repented. So he's the one that is condemned by his own testimony. James 2 recognizes his faith before repentance as dead. That's something I won't argue with. I've always said that they had a dead faith that did not trust Jesus Christ. Now the Warren logic, and he didn't reply to this, he's letting me use Warren's logic. If doctrine X implies doctrine Y, and if Y is false, then X is also false. Now I'm using this again about this dead faith thing he's got here. Faith in Christ at its inception is dead faith and before repentance, he says, is dead faith. So that implies that God commands sinners to have dead faith in Christ at faith inception. God commands faith? Yes. God commands faith before repentance? Elkin says yes. What kind of faith does, do men have before repentance? Elkin says dead. So God commands a man to have dead faith before repentance. Now you know that's not so. So doctrine Y is false, therefore doctrine X is false, therefore faith in Christ at its inception is not dead as this man is trying to teach. Now you got to appear and talk a little bit about uh, repentance and faith. I want to give you J.D. Bales' definition of repentance here. Repentance is changed from I will not to I will. The change of mind which results in the redirection of life. Now keep that in mind. I will not, and then a man says, I will. Now look at this one. Unbelief is I will not. Belief is I will. The change of mind takes place here. According to J.D. Bales then, repentance and faith are one and the same, going hand in hand together, one turning from unbelief, turning to faith, this is the truth about repentance. That's why he doesn't know anything about repentance because that faith he had before his repentance was dead. It was dead because he didn't repent at the same time he had the faith. That's why it was dead. He just had it up here as a mental, uh, mental ascent or intellectual type thing in his head and it didn't move him down in his soul in him. Now that deadly parallel he brought up here, I'll tell you who's dead, whose death that is. It's his. His deadly parallel, he denies that faith is a work by using this parallel. He denies that faith is a work by using the parallel. And yet in the spiritual sword, I read that faith is a work. Now he says faith without work is dead. All right, but he said faith is a work. Now how can you have then faith without works is dead, Mr. Elkins, if faith is a work? Faith itself is a work. Don't you believe faith is a work? Is it a living work or a dead work? I believe it's a living work. This is the work of God that you believe. All right, if it's the work of God before repentance, as he puts it, if it's the work of God that you believe before repentance, as he puts it, then it's not a dead work. It's a living work. But he says faith before repentance is dead. You better come back to McGarvey's position because I don't know what that's not a little bit easier to defend. Turn over my uh, restoration booklet to page 25 and let's... I said I brought this for correction purposes. Well... If I pay tribute to Garland and Warren's arguments, 
I'll have to change this. If I stick with the restoration historical position, I'll have to leave it as is. But on page 25, right in the middle of the page there where I start these uh, syllogisms or whatever, look at this. Faith is a work, spiritual sword. But faith before, now scratch out baptism and put in repentance because that's what Garland said. We have to change it now. I've scratched it out of mine. Faith before repentance is dead. Hence, faith is a dead work before repentance and should be repented of, according to Hebrews. All right, let's go to the next one. Scratch out baptism there. Restorationists teach that faith before baptism, scratch out baptism, put in repentance. Faith before repentance is dead. Garland Elkin. Restorationists say they have faith before repentance. Hence, restorationists have a dead faith before repentance. Let's go on down. Thomas Warren says, the word dead means inoperative, without power, without any force at all. A dead faith is powerless. Uh, it cannot bring salvation to the lost man. But restorationists teach that faith before repentance again is a dead faith. Hence, restorationists have an inoperative faith without power, without any force at all. A dead faith which cannot bring salvation to the lost man. All right, go on further. Restorationists teach that dead faith is the same kind as the faith of devil. But restorationists profess to have a dead faith before repentance. Hence, restorationists have the same kind of faith as devil. Then the last one, James 2, 20 and 26, condemns dead faith. And Garland Elkins bore witness to that on answering the question. But restorationists profess to have dead faith before repentance. Hence, James 2... 20 to 26 condemns the dead faith of restorationists. Turn to page 31. Down at the bottom of the page, which horn will Elkins take? Down to page 31 at the bottom. What kind of faith does God command before? Scratch out baptism and write in repentance. Is it living, obedient faith, or dead faith? Before repentance, God commands faith. What kind is it? Dead or alive? If he says living, obedient faith, then faith before repentance is not the dead faith of James 2, you see. If he says dead faith, then God commands men to have the dead faith which is condemned in James 2. So he's just moved it back from where McGarvey had it at baptism. He's just moved it back in his little plan of H, B, uh, C, R, B, or whatever. All right, look at here, one minute, this chart here, the blackbird chart. Now, folks, he's got this restoration principle idea up here, but he never has applied it. He never has told us who the bird is. He never has told us anything about this tree. Uh, he wanted to know if it's a tree or a bird. Well, folks, if you plant an acre and you're going to get a tree, anybody knows that. I don't have to answer that. But is that tree your restoration movement? Is that seed your restoration doctrine? Is this bird that dropped the seed Alexander Campbell? Who is the bird, Mr. Elkins? We want to know. <laughs> Tell us who the bird is. I believe he'll have to say it's Alexander Campbell because he's already said he taught the truth and restored the church by the preaching of the gospel, and yet the man never in all his life was baptized for in order to the remission of sin. That was discovered after he was baptized in 1812 by a Baptist preacher. And he hasn't defended Campbell's baptism, Campbell's gospel, Campbell's restoration movement at all, and yet that's what he said about it. Gentlemen moderators, Mr. Ross, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure for me to be here with you during this debate, and I'm grateful to all who've had any part. This congregation, Brother uh, Varner, Brother Pugh, and I'm grateful to Brother Noel Meredith, an excellent Bible student, for being my moderator. And uh, Mr. Ross made mention of Brother Warren's coming, and by the way, uh, talking to Brother Warren about it, he was writing his own notes, not notes for me then. But that's the way he assumes on a number of things. Brother Warren left his wife very ill. So ill, he thought about going back from Pittsburgh. And, and I appreciate the fact that he's here. But you know, Mr. Ross has just conceded 
and I appreciate it very, very much. He has now said that the sea, that the acorn would produce an oak tree. All right, if the acorn brings forth according to its kind, and if the seed is the word of God, Luke 8, 11, planted in the good soil, and if it brings forth according to its kind, and it brought forth New Testament Christians in the first century, that's what it will bring forth now. But the truth about the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, if he wants to know who the bird is, it makes no difference who drops the seed. Why, if a man learned the truth, taught the truth, whether he's a member of the church or not, if he taught the truth and it fell into somebody else's good and honest heart, that individual could obey the gospel and that individual might be what seed always makes people in that case Christians. And it wouldn't make any difference who baptized him either. All right, let me point out James 2 and verse 26. James 2 and in verse 26, I want to know the deadly parallel Chart, this answers all that he said on this matter of dead faith. And he keeps talking about Brother McGarvey and how the uh, claims that faith was dead until baptism. And now it seems he may be trying to have it dead to repentance. But then a man who would quote the spiritual sword 73 or 76 times and pervert, change, etc., 53 times, I don't think you'd be too surprised at that. But now know, as far as the body, apart from the spirit, is dead, even so faith, apart from works, is dead. James 2, 26. Thus a deadly parallel. The body plus the spirit equal a live man. The body minus the spirit equal a dead man. All right? Faith plus works equal live faith. Faith minus work equal dead faith. Now, friends, the Baptist doctrine is that salvation is by a dead Faith by a dead faith. Now his proposition teaches salvation by a dead faith by implication. Now he can never get around that. And by the way, I would suggest this. He talked about believing on Christ. But I'll tell you, the Bible does say we believe on Christ, but it says we're baptized in two. In two Christ. And the word believe on is the same in John 8, 30 and through 44, in John 12, 42 and 43, and uh, in John 3, 16, and in 3, 18, pistuo ace. Why doesn't he deal with that? He cannot deal with that. He dodged Galatians 3, 27, baptized into Christ. And I'm glad it's going into the book. I think it'll make some very interesting and profitable reading. Well, I would like to suggest then that we go just a little bit further, but look one more time to this chart. I don't need to comment on it. You are an intelligent audience. And you'll understand. All right? Let us have then the one that we were beginning with a moment ago. Notice that we are baptized into Christ. Salvation is in Christ. Now, he did not deal with that. He did not because he could not. I'm not saying that the doctrine has been so. He talked about what an easy time he had here during the debate. Well, now, you know you're the judge of that. You're the judge of that. I'll tell you what, he had a difficult enough time that he never could get around Bill this first. You think he didn't have enough time? Last night in his first speech, by his own admission, it was 13 minutes out of a 20-minute speech before he ever got around to his affirmation. And then, as I recall, he even then didn't define his proposition. This man has not dealt with it. There's a lot of difference in filibustering and in facing up to the situation. I came up here to have a debate with a man that I hoped and thought would deal with the argument. That's why I came. Now, and if he came up here for some other reason, that's his problem. But I wish he didn't have the problem. I wish he would have dealt with the situation. Now, notice, here's a challenge to Mr. Ross. I asked him to write in the following blanks. And by the way, he can write. He just writes, 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 and writes, and writes some more. You know, he can write. He can even debate with the audience. Have his free plan material, and no matter what I say, then get on that material. And say, uh, oh, I'm a puppet, I'm the devil, I'm worse than the devil, and all of that kind of thing. Well, all of that is beside the point. And he wishes, I imagine, I don't know what he does or not. I'm sorry that he ever said it, for his own benefit. A challenge to Ross. Right in the following blank, the passage which teaches that men believe in to Christ. If he could have found the passage, it would have ended this debate. He could have converted me about this doctrine. I have found the passage. 
that says baptized into Christ. He does not believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, I say it with kindness. I said it, I believe, the first night of this debate. When this man denies such passages, he is not in the role of the Bible exegete. He is taking the root of the infidel. And no wonder so many people turn aside and have nothing to do with any religion. It's because of the teaching of a man like this and those who teach like doctors. But let's have the next chart then. This chart, I'd like for you to note that I brought up, you tell me how much he said about this. You tell me how much he said about it. He did not even mention this. He would not even mention it. I brought it up more than one time. The Bible says in Romans 10 and in verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now you'll know there is hearing, believing, there is calling, and then comes salvation. Now note, calling on the name of the Lord is an act of obedience which comes after believing and before being saved. Therefore, therefore what? No one is saved at the point of faith alone before and without further act of obedience. Could be raised just a little bit more. Therefore, Ross's proposition is false. Could we have the next one? I'd like to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that your soul is at stake in this. I, bl I don't have the number of them right here. Yes, I do. Your, uh, your soul is at stake at this, and I want you to remember what the Bible teaches on this and to study your own Bible. In John 8 and also in John 12, 42 and 43, Jesus points out some believers. They're said to be believers, but who have dead faith. Now, you will notice. Many believe on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. Now, you'll note down here at the bottom of the same time, you will note that this is a negative imperative in contrast to the quintilliar Arius belief. That is, they kept on not confessing from Robinson. And by the way, I did not dishonor Robinson, Robinson. I took, of course, exactly what he said a few nights ago. Now, Roth did not take Robinson, Robertson on Mark 16, 16. And uh, the truth about the matter is, I was describing what he defined by the way of the Aris party system. But anyway, no, here are the leaders. Aris expressed the fact as such that did, now no, these Pharisees, were people who would not confess their faith. But remember, those who deny Christ will be denied by Christ. All right, thank you very much, and this time I appreciate a point of order. And let me tell you why. It was in the speech. You can check it. But I believe there was a word left off of a chart, and I failed to call it to your attention. That gives me an opportunity to call it to your attention. Thank you very much. All right. Note this. No, here are believers that did not, and we meant to put that there, and overlooked it. And so we'll put that there so that can be put in correctly in the book. I made the statement the last time. Every time I've made the argument, I've made it. But in looking at the chart, I noticed that it was not there. All right, did not confess their faith. But remember, those who deny Christ will be denied the Christ. Now, no further. They love the glory of men more than the glory of God. Here, passage. If any man love our Lord Jesus, love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be an anathema. Let him be an anathema. Here are people who love the glory of man more than the glory of God. Now, Jesus teaches through Paul that if a man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let them be anathema. And I've already discussed that uh, perhaps enough in detail, but let, let's get the next chart if we could. On this chart, I want you to note this. If John 12, 42 and 43 teaches that some believers...
kept on not confessing Christ, then there can be such a thing as a lost believer. We discussed that time and again. Number two, John 12, 42 and 43, teaches that some believers kept on not confessing Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the conclusion. Therefore, there can be such a thing as a lost believer. I don't know how many times I would have to say that. He had somewhat to say about the fact that how uh, that I spent uh, my speeches in the affirmative on Mark 16, 16. But ladies and gentlemen, isn't it amazing that the truth is so powerful that that one verse eliminated, repudiated, denied, and forever exposed his doctrine. I'll tell you why all of those statements are made. It is for uh, the idea of getting the attention off of the truth. Now, why did they, why did he not answer it? The truth about the matter is this, as I mentioned a few nights ago. If a man is, goes out somewhere and takes his gun and kills a dog, he doesn't keep on and on and on and on and on and on killing that dog, shooting that dog. He's dead when he shoots him. He doesn't keep on killing him. Now, listen, before this debate began, I just thought, it would be interesting to see a Baptist preacher have to deal with that passage alone to make one argument. And I'll tell you, my faith is really strengthened tonight because I have seen the fact that nothing can be done with it. Well, in regard to the matter of Campbellite, let's take that one. I believe that's another charge that we have. Let's take the seed principle charge. Ladies and gentlemen, if there was not a member of the church in the whole world, a man, if he were to be on a desert island in the United States or anywhere else, he found a copy of the Bible, read it, believed it, and obeyed it, what would he become? Why, he would become what he always produces. He would become a member of the Church of Christ. Now, I don't need to do much comment on the fact that uh, whether he calls us Campbellites and all of that kind of thing, you know there's such a thing as calling a man a rather ugly name and not yelling about it, but it's still a bad name. When I refer to Mr. Ross as a Baptist, I call him what he calls himself. When he calls me a Campbellite, he calls me that which I do not accept, I utterly repudiate. And furthermore, a man who does that, number one, does it through ignorance, or he does it because he deliberately is trying to hurt and wound and even sometimes rub the salt in it. But ladies and gentlemen, my prayer is, he talked about my prayer in Memphis, my prayer for him is, Lord, be merciful. Hopefully he knows not what he does. I hope he will later learn better. All right, you'll know here, a bird carries an acorn. The acorn falls into the good and to the soil. It brings forth an old tree. The word of God is the seed of the kingdom. It is planted into a good and honest heart. It produces. What does it produce? Well, an acorn, he said, will produce an oak tree. All right, will an acorn produce a bird? No, the seed always brings forth according to its To its kind. Now, the next chart, if you will. And while we're getting to this next chart, let me suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that we've been over this before. I won't even read it, but I want you to know here, all of it that is, the seed is the word of God, the good soil, the only heart, and note the fact that the result is in a child of God or is it a child of the devil? Well, he never did tell us about that. He had plenty of time. He didn't get around to it. Could we have the next one? I have suggested to you earlier that in regard to the matter of the power of the seed, that I can hold enough seed in one hand to provide lumber to build a city if given enough time to grow. In addition to that, I can hold enough wheat in one hand to feed the world if given time to grow it in good soil. Now, just so, it is with the word, the seed, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. And if I had time, I'd quote those passages. But here's an illustration. Men on a desert island with a copy of the Bible, and men could learn the truth from it, and even though they baptized each other, the person obeying what he knows to be true would be enough to clinch the fact that the seed brings forth according to its kind if we believe the Bible. Sometimes, some time ago, I was preaching on a Sunday morning at Get Well, and when I completed the sermon, and a man came forward, a young man to be baptized, a lady came forward to be restored, sitting seven feet back. I didn't have time to count that. A man leaped to his feet. He said, I can't stand it any longer. Well, I didn't know whether he couldn't stand my sermon or what was wrong with him. I turned around and uh, I said, uh, would you like to obey the gospel? He almost literally, well, he walked on ladies' feet getting out. He almost literally ran down the aisle. 
I took him by the hand. I asked him if he understood what was involved in becoming a Christian. He said, yes, sir, I do. He said, my wife is a member of the Church of Christ, and I have been attending for a year and a half. Of course, not that. And when I asked him to, all, to make the good confession that Christ is the Son of God, I asked him, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? He said, I do. You can hear him with perhaps 500 people there. We went back into the baptistry, and while we prepared to baptize, I asked him further about his background and what he knew about the truth. He said, my father is an Episcopalian priest and told where in your town, but I have heard the word, I have learned the word, I want to do what the Bible teaches. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I'm pleading for. Now then, in regard to the uh, chart that I want us to see one more time, I want us to see the chart on being baptized into Christ. This chart in Galatians 3, how many, four minutes. Well, let's don't take that chart. I want to say this, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says in Acts 8, and uh, let me go to Mark 8, perhaps, 36 and 37, and get that passage. Some years ago, or two centuries ago or more, when they entered into the tomb of Charlemagne, they found that bony finger glued to Mark 8, 36 and 37 which says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now that passage implies a number, or infers a number of things. Number one, that a man has a soul. Number one, that a man may exchange his soul. Number two, that he may lose his soul. And furthermore, that there is no compensation for the loss of the soul. Some time ago I saw a film of a young of a lady who was born without arms you may have seen it i was amazed that she could comb her hair tie her children's shoes cook drive a car and all of those different things and you see there was the law of compensation but if you lose your immortal soul there is no law of compensation ladies and gentlemen i would not be away from my family tonight I would not be here tonight if I did not want to go to heaven. I love your souls. Paul said, and most gladly, therefore, will I spend and be spent on behalf of your souls, 2 Corinthians 12 and in verse 15. It won't be long until all of us would be standing before the judgment bar of God. I cannot save you. Mr. Ross cannot save you. You remember that the Lord said to the twelve, will you also go away? Peter said, Lord... To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In Luke 14, 33, Jesus said, So therefore, whosoever he be of you, that renounceth not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. There's a wonderful song that says, Heaven will surely be worth it all. It will be worth it all. I'm not an enemy to Mr. Bob L. Ross. I have goodwill toward everybody here tonight. But you know the Bible says in John 12, 42, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. But remember that Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never endorsed what you were doing. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. In Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 of Christ it is said, Though he were son, Yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. 
Thank you very much. And if I could say this, I think I failed to mis mention Mr. Keenan a few moments ago, and I want to know, want you to know that I included him in saying that it's been my pleasure to meet him. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Elkins, Mr. Meredith, Mr. Warren, Mr. Ross, Mr. Keenan, Mr. Dooley, we thank you for this week of study that we've had. We would again like to express our appreciation to the elders of the Camden Avenue Church of Christ for furnishing the building for this debate when we were unable, when Mr. Keenan was unable to obtain the Parkersburg Field House, and he graciously consented to have the debate here in this building. We appreciate the brethren here also in opening the building and his consent. We like to express appreciation to the elders of Harmer Hill for their support, Brother Charles Q, who's worked very closely in the debate to bring it to the fruition that it has. We have averaged 1,049 per night. We've had many involved in the debate from various angles that we'd like to express our appreciation to. It'd be time consuming to enumerate them one by one, but we assure you that we appreciate the many hours of labor and the assistance so many have given. We may not comment on the debate in fairness to both sides, but we allow and we encourage you to present and study the evidence rather than has been presented. Weigh the materials in the light of the scriptures. And then if you're out of harmony with what the Bible teaches, we encourage you to accept the truth of the Bible. We encourage you the literature room remains set up in room 112. Mr. Ross, Mr. Keenan, and Mr. Elkins has available some materials. There are free materials. There are materials that are for sale. We encourage you to approach that uh, literature room and obtain what you desire. We also like to remind you that the book will be printed. A contract is on the book. Uh, we have a 90-day grammatical correction of the tape 